Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Dr. John Scalco, um, and we're going to be discussing today the case against lying. And I think what we're going to do differently this time is, you know, we'll begin by having, uh, you know, Dr. Scalco present his case. I'll ask a few questions just about maybe some other things related to this area. And then we will actually move more to audience Q&A. Mm -hmm. And so we're interested in hearing questions from the audience. And I can see that there are already um, a few that have been asked. And so I'm excited to get this started. So uh, do you mind if I call you John? <laughs> that might be sure, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Well, John, how have you been? Good. It's good to be on here again. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I know it's been a little while. Mm -hmm. I am writing on some other topics these days. Uh, so um, like assisted suicide, uh, I have some work I'm been doing on that. And then on animal cognition, actually, of all things. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's always good to return to the age old topic of lying, which people seem to be perennially interested in mm -hmm. uh, either defending or um, against it which happens to be my case, so. Right, and you know, it seems like, John, you have an attraction to the kind of hard, tough cases, the the controversial cases in ethics, and so mm -hmm. it's really nice to see that there are people who are actually not afraid to go into those topics and really, you know, provide a Thomistic insight into them. Mm -hmm. um, so, John, let's begin by just kind of, you know, I'll give you the floor to just make your case for the case against lying, and what's gonna happen is I'll kind of drop out of the screen. I'm still in the studio. I can still hear you. I can still interact with you. Um, but I want to give you the full screen uh, to present. So if that's okay with you, then I'm just going to drop out real quick. Yeah, it sounds sounds great. So um, uh, first, I apologize. My camera is kind of like a, a strange angle here up above the screen. Uh, so then I look down at the screen. Uh, I realize um, uh, it looks like I'm not like looking at the, the camera. But uh, don't worry. I know uh, you're all there. So... Uh, I have about five reasons. You could perhaps give some more uh, or even maybe condense some of them uh, as to why I think lying isn't just wrong, but why I hold that it's uh, actually something that should never be done, not even little white lies, which I realize may sound a bit counterintuitive because um, I think people's intuitions generally seem to be the opposite on this issue. But I'd just like to begin by challenging some of those intuitions by saying, first off, intuitions are often faulty, as we may know, and secondly, they really depend upon, I think, your peer group or surrounding group of friends, uh, which, well, depending upon who your friends are, they might be so good or maybe not so good or maybe, um, as with most people, maybe somewhere in between. Uh, but the real issue is, um, are they right? Well, obviously, if you think about it, presumably not everyone uh, does everything right um, all the time, right? Uh, unless they were a Jesus, right? Or God or something like that. Uh, so we have plenty of people uh, also historically who hold that lying is always wrong, such as Aristotle, Augustine, um, Aquinas, Immanuel Kant. And so I ask, whose intuitions do you trust more? Those of your friend group, your peers, or those of, say, some of these most brilliant moral philosophers who have ever uh, lived on uh, the planet. Um, so in terms of the, the five actual reasons, apart from just these appeals to authority, uh, the first one we could give as to why lying is always wrong as well. Um, if you think about it, the truth is something that's quite high good. Uh, if there literally was no truth, we literally couldn't function as a society. Um, it'd be a big problem. Uh, I mean, how would you even order food or communicate with people if um, truth wasn't possible? And if you think about it, the primary means of communicating the truth uh, is really, well, by means of uh, assertions, right? Uh, assertions are a type of speech act whereby you're presenting something as true, putting yourself behind it. Um, this is really the primary or per se means of communicating what you think actually is true. Um, so in telling a lie, the problem is you are using assertions, you're making an assertion, but not for the sake of conveying the truth. You're actually twisting assertions away from their proper end of the truth for uh, some sort of a falsehood, right? Um, and so I think this is a problem, of course, um, for every lie, because every lie uh, necessarily is an untruthful assertion. Uh, secondly, uh, 
to borrow from Augustine here, uh, if lying is sometimes good, and this would mean that it's true that lying is sometimes morally okay, but this would entail that, well, the truth teaches us to be liars. If you think about it, well, doesn't that seem a bit strange, right? Um, I mean, this is like saying loving piety teaches us we should hate our parents or chastity says commit adultery or justice says commit means of uh, deeds of murder or thievery, right? Uh, but there seems something inherently problematic about this, right? Uh, I mean, true justice is never going to command you to commit acts of injustice, right? Nor chastity to commit acts of adultery, nor piety to uh, hate your parents. So neither can truth teach us to be liars. Thirdly, um, if lying is sometimes okay, uh, then we can say, practically speaking, why should people believe you on other sorts of matters, right? Uh, so it just decreases um, trust uh, in terms of uh, truthful communication in society. Um, fourth, we can say just as kind of a general principle of ethics here, uh, teleology is very important. And so you'll notice in uh, both the world of nature and then also in the realm of human action, what makes things good as well that they're actually tending towards their end and bad things are those that don't tend towards their end as set by nature. So for example, uh, turkeys, what makes a turkey a good turkey? Well, it has to grow to presumably some proper size, right? Or have a natural um, tendency within it that is growing to a certain poundage, maybe 20 pounds in some cases. Uh, if it were growing maybe a bit too big, then we say something seems to be going wrong here with the action of uh, growth that's going on with it. So too has got to have feathers, right? And do the things that turkeys um, are naturally ordered towards, right? Um, such as gobbling, walking about, eating food, um, and so on. Uh, likewise with um, honeybees, we could say, what are honeybees ordered towards by nature if they're the, the worker bees? Well, flying about, collecting nectar, protecting the hive from intruders, um, cleaning out debris from the hive, um, so probably not pooping all over the place inside the hive, hopefully outside of the hive. Uh, we say worker bees that don't do this are not so good bees, you might say, or bad worker bees, right? Uh, if they're not actually defending the hive and instead stay there's stinging other worker bees, right? Or um, uh, killing the queen bee, for example, right? Um, we notice something similar happens uh, even with um, mm, uh, uh, different um, <clears throat> um, organs within the body, such as say, for example, uh, or the heart, right? So the heart, if it's not pumping blood, right? Uh, we say that it's a bad heart, something's gone wrong there, right? So too, in the case of other actions, uh, if these actions are ordered towards their ends as set by nature, we say they're good. If they're ordered away from it, it's bad. So we notice in the case of hearing, right? Well, if you're apprehending sounds by means of the act of hearing, it's, it can be a good act of hearing, right? Qua hearing. Uh, there might, of course, be other, other um, um, uh, uh, there are gonna be other problems, okay, sometimes um, uh, with regards to um, things that can be good in some respects, but maybe there will be in other uh, respects in which they're bad. So for something to be good, it basically has to fulfill a whole lot more requirements, whereas for something to be bad, to borrow from pseudo Dionysius, it just has to fail in one respect. Uh, maybe we can get a little more into that in the, the Q&A, okay. Um, so the case of lying, right? Um, uh, well, you're engaging in an assertive speech act, right? And assertive speech acts by nature, right, are ordered towards the truth. That's the whole point as to why assertions exist in the first place. So in telling a lie, you're twisting once again uh, the action, which has its natural order towards truth away from that end. So it's much like, say, um, you could engage in the act of hearing, not for the sake of, say, apprehending sounds or understanding for the sake of not truth, right? Um, so something like that is also, I think, going on in the case of uh, telling every lie. You have a, a disordered sort of action, we might say, um, kind of built into the action. 
Um, the uh, uh, next reason um, and um, <clears throat> final reason I'm going to give here as to why I think uh, lying is always wrong, I think is maybe one more particular for um, uh, Christians, um, though perhaps I think people of maybe other religions might also maybe be friendly to it, is that, uh, well, lying dishonors the martyrs. I mean, if you look at the example of um, uh, Thomas More or other people who refused to tell lies in renouncing their faith, they could have easily just lyingly renounced their faith, but, well, they didn't do so, and to this day they are quite honored, I think rightly so, um, by many people throughout the world. Um, if lying, though, actually really is sometimes good, well, then this would mean um, that I think these people actually did something morally wrong, right? Because you have an obligation to preserve your life as much as reasonably possible. And if there's any means you can save your life for the life of others from death, wherein there's nothing morally wrong uh, in regards to the steps you would take to preserve your life or those of the others, you should actually go ahead and do that, right? So if um, for example, the way you could save your life is you jump out of the way of an oncoming bus, right? You should do so. If you don't do so, well, there's something wrong. You've done something uh, negligent with regards to your life. Uh, so likewise, if the only means whereby you can save your life is tell a lie, right? Um, and even if it's about God, right? And there's nothing wrong with this. Well, then you ought to do so, right? Well, Thomas More could have done this. Right. Uh, so, too, with all the many of the other martyrs, they could have just <clears throat> held the truth in their heart and then with their lips spoken otherwise. Right. Um, and saving their life. But, well, uh, they didn't. Uh, so I think if the people hold that lying is sometimes OK, then actually these people we should not honor at all and actually hold their names in execration. Uh, so these are my, my main reasons here. Uh, dishonors the martyrs. Um, I think there's something intrinsically disordered in the action itself. Uh, <clears throat> and then well, how can the truth teach us to be liars? All right, thank you for that presentation. So um, here I'll, I'll engage in a few questions <clears throat> and then kind of give more time for the audience to start bringing in questions. Um, so I, I guess my first question is, all right, so you know, you laid out your reasons, right? And those are all good and philosophical. And I mean, and even there's like some practical details in, in there about, as well as about trust and contracts. Mm -hmm. But I mean, suppose that, um, and this is the classic example, right? You have Nazis who come to your door and right. let's say that they're doing their routine neighborhood checks. You have mm -hmm. Jews in your basement mm -hmm. and they just ask you without actually maybe having a prior rumor or suspicion, just are you harboring enemies of the state? Mm -hmm. Are you harboring Jews in your basement or anywhere mm -hmm. in the house? How would you respond? Um, well, which question are they asking me? I'm, am I harboring enemies of the state or am I hiding Jews? Because it's, Let's gonna, say, um, it's actually a little bit different different answers sure. I think we could give, right? Sure. Um, well, I'm interested. Let's say that um, both questions are asked, right? Mm -hmm. And how would you, like, maybe how would you answer those differently depending on the circumstance? Uh well, are you harboring enemies of the state? Mm -hmm. um, I think you might be able to reply truthfully to that, perhaps. Um, no, right? Uh, I mean, maybe in their sense of the state, but um, mm -hmm. it seems like there's maybe some true sense of the state here, right? Uh, that uh, they're not really true enemies of, of Germany, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they, they would love to be citizens of it. I'm sure some of them probably historically were citizens, right? Uh, they're not doing anything really contrary to, I think, the true good of the state, contrary to the Nazis' belief. Uh, um, <clears throat> the second one, um, are you, what, what was it? Are you harboring Jews? Yeah, just more direct or narrow. Oh, mm -hmm. oh okay. Um, so it's not, are they in your house? It's, are you harboring Jews? Um, uh, this one might be a, a bit more difficult, to say the least, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you say, no, well, you definitely are. So I think you would be lying in that case. You can't say that. So what exactly can you do? Well, you could stay silent. Um, maybe you could um, fake a stutter or something, right? Um, or uh, <clears throat> perhaps um, looks like the throat isn't functioning so well that day. So you make some some uh, hand gestures. Maybe you could punch the Nazi in the face. That was a nice solution. <laughs> or you could just say, 
Yes, I am. I know where they are, but I will not tell you. Go search elsewhere. You can mm -hmm. say that truthfully. Now, is it the best <clears throat> um, option? Well, it might be morally speaking, but in terms of the implications, what's going to happen afterwards, probably not the most pleasant because either they're going to torture you um, or shoot you uh, or they might even just search the place anyway. But also, mm -hmm. for all we know, why are they at your door in the first place unless there's some suspicion or it's just some sort of... Um, uh, a mandate, right? And if there's some suspicion, well, maybe they would be searching in any way, regardless of what you say, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so really, I think there's a lot of, uh, how would we say, um, aspect kind of, of of luck to this. And I don't think the moral life uh, should ultimately really depend upon luck. Like luck doesn't determine whether or not something that's done is actually good or, or bad sort of um, action, right? It's more about the object end and um, <clears throat> circumstances right yeah um, and well is that the is that your whole answer yeah i mean i think i think there's other mm. things maybe that could also be done in that case uh but yeah basically you should not just say no you shouldn't lie yeah. about it okay um is the main answer yeah i mean um and i guess another question that i had too was just you know you mentioned the point about trust right mm -hmm. i mean think about think about this right i, I don't know if you watch goodfellas <laughs> But, you know, that, there's that scene where he's on the stand. I forget. Uh, it's Ray Liotta's character uh, and, oh, uh, Henry Hill or something like that. And he has to lie or say something or he has he can't he's not opening his mouth. He he's got a mm -hmm. cover for his mob buddies. Right. And mm -hmm. I mean, actually, that increases trust among the group that, oh, wow, like this guy, like if he's put under pressure, um, he's not going to budge or tell the truth or he might even mislead the police. Right. Or, I mean, take another, you can use all kinds of examples. Like maybe the Jews in your basement would really appreciate it if you lie. And they'd mm -hmm. actually trust you even more because you're willing to put your neck out for them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe that's one way that you could reverse the lying, of, uh, the, the, the point about trust. How would you respond to that? So uh, the trust is among just members of the group, though, that's increased, right? And it's not increased mm -hmm. in, in maybe society in general or with relation to the people outside of the group. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, it's almost like boils down to seems like a form of consequentialism then. Mm -hmm. Well, you're doing something um, that inherently decreases trust for the sake of increasing trust, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, then, of course, that opens the door to all sorts of critiques that could be given of consequentialism. Um, I think that the trust point um, uh, maybe isn't sort of a as strong of a point as an objection maybe to lying or as to why lying is always wrong. It's more kind of a uh, prudential consideration um, as to why should people believe what you say if you think lying is sometimes okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So I think I have one more question, then we'll move into some of what the audience has asked. So I wanted to ask you if you watch a Father Gregory Pines debate with Janet Smith and what you I thought did. about it. Yes. Um, very interesting. Uh, a bit long, a couple hours, right? I realize mm -hmm. there's there's some uh, Q&A in there. Um, I think uh, Gregory, Father Gregory did a um, uh, fair job. Um, there may have been some other responses I would have given than when he, what he gave, uh, but I think he gave some kind of interesting uh, takes or angles uh, that might be a little bit different uh, in the debate. Janet Smith's um, Points, I don't know if there was too much significantly new that she added from what I've heard uh, or read of um, her views on this earlier. Uh, it looks like in the, the debate, um, a lot of her views uh, or defense of her view boils down to, um, like, so I think on one, the one hand, intuitions, mm -hmm. right? It's so like, well, how could this possibly be? Um, uh, how could we possibly have this standard that lying is always wrong and still do police work or have spying, right? For example, um, or what about dementia patients, right? Um, and they keep asking, say, the same questions, right? Are you going to lie to them or are you not, right? Uh, so there's the intuition aspect, but then I think another really large aspect of her account still really just comes back to the definition of a lie, and she just appeals to this first definition in the Catechism. Uh, where it includes the right to know within the definition of lying, 
right? So uh, to lie is to um, uh, uh, say speak like a falsehood uh, with the intention to deceive to someone who has the right to know, um, to kind of paraphrase the account she gives. But then it's interesting um, in the context of uh, the debate, right? Uh, she seems to kind of want to qualify this uh, this definition that she gives because Father Gregory Pine brings up, well, what about the case of apostasy, hmm. right? So you can ask, do people have any right to know uh, your religion or that you believe in Jesus? And Janet Smith's response is, well, your relationship with Jesus seems to be a fundamental reality. And so maybe you should like, this doesn't uh, apply. It shouldn't really apply. But then on the other hand, like immediately after she says that, she seems to uh, um, kind of maybe change her mind a little bit or not be so sure and saying, well, may I've maybe really exactly thought this through. Uh, so maybe actually they don't have a right to know. Mm. So maybe Father Walter Chizik, for example, could have just lied about his faith, right, or being Catholic, um, which in that case, um, um, if she's biting the bullet, I think that'd be a good modus tollens or reason not to hold her her view, right, uh, at least with regards to um, uh, lying, right, and the, the definition of, of a lie, right. Uh, I think that the big the big problem, one of the one of the many big problems, right, I've already, I think, roundly criticized a lot um, in my book, and then also I have an article um, uh, in the ACPQ. Um, I think it's called uh, Catholics and Hugo Grotius's definition of lying, a critique. Uh, I roundly criticize the definition of lying where people want to say lying is something like uttering a falsehood with the intention to deceive to someone who has the right to know. I've given many reasons, but one of them that I think applies to, I think, both accounts that Janet Smith gives, if she wants to add the qualifier, fundamental reality to her definition or not keep the qualifier is, is this. Little white lies are lies, right? I think everyone admits this just about, right? And many people would say, yes, they're not really um, so bad, which I also actually do agree with that um, little white lies, they're wrong, but they're not like, seriously wrong or as wrong as other things like murder or thievery or all sorts of other um, bad things that can happen, right? They still shouldn't be done though, right? Um, the issue is if you include rights within the definition, right, of a lie or the right to know or fundamental reality. So say you hold it's the definition of a lie is uttering an untruth to someone uh, with the uh, uttering an untruth with the intention to deceive to someone who has the right to know that truth, right? Uh, well, presumably there's cases where we'd say um, this is just a little white lie and the person had no right to know the truth, right? So the problem is on this new definition of a lie, which was in the catechism just briefly for a certain small number of years, right? Which I think was changed because, well, there was a mistake in the first printing, um, otherwise, why else would you change it? I'm assuming it's not just a stylistic reason. Um, on this definition of the right to know view, it is logically impossible for little white lies to exist. Which I think is, okay, regardless of what you say about lying, that's just a bad definition of a lie. Just go ahead and just outright defend lying instead, uh, which is why um, what some people actually do do right i think that might be a little bit better of a, a position to take um uh, if you want to say hold on to the fundamental reality well, what does she mean by fundamental reality maybe she means something like well this is what's most important to you in life um jesus is most important to you in life so you shouldn't lie about what's most important to you in life right well if that's the case then all sorts of other things unrelated to jesus or religion um you could tell untruths about because they're not about your fundamental reality right so also those things would not just be lies they would just be i don't know some other sort of speech act right mm -hmm. um i mean like look okay you can go into a grocery store and tell people all sorts of people in there all sorts of crazy stuff about what's in your pocket because none of them have any right to know what's in your pocket 
You can tell them, look, I got $100 in my pocket. I have $0 in my pocket. Uh, I think most people, including myself, would say, you're, you're lying if you really have $20 there. None of these people have any right to know, but on the definition of right to know, Janet Smith would have to say they haven't told any lie. I think this is just a bit um, absurd, mm -hmm. um, regardless of whether you think lying is okay or not. Uh, uh, that that there has to be something about the definition of a lie that I don't think goes counter to most people's um, intuitions about um, sort of basic fact about um, linguistic speech acts that everyone seems to experience on an ordinary basis for the most part, right? Um, uh, I guess there's other things I could say. Uh, maybe we could leave that for the Q&A about um, uh, the debate, but um, people haven't watched it. Watch it. It's very interesting. <clears throat> All right. So here's a, here's a question that I've seen in the live chat, and I think um, I want to cover it. So what I'm going to try to do is actually read it um, in full because it's multiple comments. And then the last right. comment, I think, is the one that I'll leave on the screen. But this is a case from, um, at least for us as Catholic scripture. Mm -hmm. So, so it says the angel spoke truthfully, but Tobit misunderstood. There are many tales that show Tobit jumped the gun and didn't pry into the angel's words. So deception happened to Tobit by not considering, and the angel spoke truthfully. Mm -hmm. And so it says, remember, Tobit asked a specific question as to which tribe are you from? The angel did not answer the question. But by his words, Tobit assumed he did. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that's actually not, that's actually not, maybe I misread that question. Let's see. Do, 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 do. So are they saying something about, um, did the angel do something wrong here? Or oh, I see what happened. Maybe? Oh, so this person was responding to an objection that somebody said that, oh, this is a case in which an angel lied. But it's like no, that the angel didn't lie. Okay, so in this in this ballpark of family objections, I guess like there are instances in scripture where, for instance, you have um, you know Rahab and others who lied, and it seems like the Bible praises them. So, okay. uh, how would you deal with that particular family of objections? That I guess it was Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship. That's what he was responding to, at least in the Tobit case. Yeah. So um, from looking at briefly from the person replying to that comment, I, it seems like I would, I would agree. I mean, I haven't, maybe there's some context I'm missing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can say something truthfully or not, or remain silent, right? And someone misunderstands you. Uh, I don't think that's a lie, right? In order to tell a lie, you have to actually be making some sort of a, an assertion actually. So if you're not even speaking, right. Or making some sort of a, an assertive, um, action i don't think it's a lie now of course there is well you say what about um uh sign language right well you can make assertions in sign language right so you're obviously not producing an assertion by voice but um because of the conventions of sign language you can make physical gestures uh that i think signify um words or interior words or concepts of the mind right uh, which either correspond with your beliefs about reality or or not right um so if there are no sort of exterior sign here right um vocally or say by um writing right or by sign language um then it's not really a lie right um so too people misunderstand what you say i think this happens uh, quite a bit right mm -hmm. um even in my writings <laughs> write things and then people mm -hmm. say things like i hold that lying is uh, the equivalent to murder like no no i don't right um, so the, the scripture objections, yeah, there's many cases. Um, I think if you just read uh, this Secunda Secunda question 109, 110, um, particularly question 110, Article 3, uh, there are some parallel passages, of course, in Aquinas. Aqu many of the objections to Aquinas' view are from biblical passages, right? And basically he does one of two things. He says either this is not a lie because maybe they're speaking mystically or it's a figure of speech or it is a lie and shouldn't actually be praised. Right. Uh, and I think that's a good strategy and just actually just the right answer, right. To many of these sorts of um, passages here. Right. Um, now, whether every case that Aquinas discusses, um, whether his analysis is always right, um, 
is maybe another sort of uh, question here, right? Uh, in terms of cases like um, uh, the Hebrew midwives, right, which look like they're praised for the sake of telling a lie, uh, what do you do with cases like that? Well, we can say they're praised on account of a remote intention, a remote end that they're intending, and not in reg regards to the proximate end. Uh, a second answer, which interestingly isn't really mentioned in Aquinas, nor in much of the literature or any of it that I can recall, but um, that I have heard of, uh, it might be more from maybe the Franciscan tradition though, is that if you have a case of invincible ignorance and you commit a venial sin, <clears throat> but um, out of charity, so to speak, or still have the habit of charity, it can actually be meritorious. So I think in a lot mm. of cases of these small white lies, you may actually have people that are quite virtuous, but actually just didn't know any better, mm -hmm. right? Um, particularly if you're looking maybe in the Old Testament back land where maybe not everything about the moral law is as clearly revealed, um, both in terms of supernaturally and also I think naturally, because um, you have kind of a development of philosophy that just takes time historically to happen, right? Um, so perhaps also in that sense, um, there is sort of a reward, but also notice it's a temporal re reward that's given there, uh, that they're um, built houses and not um, uh, divine sort of um, houses for the afterlife. Right? Mm. And um, this is an objection that I remember a friend of mine had asked, but he didn't, he didn't post in the comment section here, but um, let's see here. One of the questions that he asked was just basically, um, you know, imagine that let's say you have a situation um, and, you know, the, you could object to maybe the, the, the scenario is too vague, but it's like you could, if you tell a yeah. lie, you know, let's say you'll save hundreds of people from a painful, torturous death, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say like the lie, we can think of it in varying degrees, right? So maybe, I mean, obviously, maybe in the case of apostasy, you wouldn't lie and say, I renounce Christ, right? You wouldn't mm -hmm. say that. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say like it's a smaller lie. Like, let's suppose that, I don't know, it's a lie like, um, you know, I'm looking at my cup in front of me, right? And the guy, whatever this this crazy kind of, mm -hmm. you know, super villain is saying, you have to say that this cup that I believe this cup is white, mm -hmm. I, outside, not inside, outside, ex, you know, in the exterior, right? Yeah, oh, a little bit. Let's say no. It's a, let's say um, it's something like red. It's a, it's a solid pure red. Okay, mm -hmm. I have to assert that. Yes. Um, so then my friend had basically made this argument. Well, doesn't it seem crazy? To believe that you couldn't lie in that circumstance um certainly i think prima facie it does seem crazy right and i think a lot of people's intui intuitions would say yes it seems crazy right but once again we have the problems well intuitions need to be trained right uh, i think aquinas's intuitions would be quite different in this case as would augustine's mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps hmm, even aristotle's right who actually holds quite a strong view that lying is always wrong uh, I think the problem, right, uh, is if you accept that lying is always wrong, but then you say it's okay in certain cases, then we'll basically open the door to blackmail, right? Uh, you, you can say, well, either steal, right, or I'm going to kill five people, or either you kill this one person, or say the bank robbers say, or we're going to kill everybody in the bank, right? Mm. Um, so you can just kind of keep multiplying um, examples here, right? Or, or evils, right? You, you're going to end up really with a version of consequentialism, right? If you can do evil for the sake of good, right? Well, then just about any action in principle can be justified. Um, even actions apart from murder. I mean, you could throw in like necrophilia, for example, right? If you had some really um, sick um, serial killer, right? Um, he says, either do this or else, right? Um, we're going to nuke some city, right? Um, at, at a certain point, uh, you just say, no, we can't do evil for the sake of good, right? Because uh, there are goods that are higher even than human life that are worth dying for. All right. And then Father John Brown, he asked the question, you know, didn't Catholic Answers have a quick summary on how this teaching could develop? Um, I know that 
maybe you know you might not be totally aware of like Catholic answer what's going on there. But I mean, does it seem as if the teaching here developed uh, on the nature of lying and, and the impermissibility of it? Uh, I mean, yeah. So there, there certainly has been some sort of development, so to speak. I think on this issue. Uh, so like prior to Augustine, actually, there, there was a minority view in the church about uh, lying, right? Um, but you have people saying some weird things like. It's like a bitter medicine. In these really hard situations, you should lie, but you should repent of it afterwards because you did wrong. Uh, where, uh, well, this seems a bit strange uh, because we well, have the words of St. Paul, don't do evil for the sake of good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so then Augustine, of course, comes along and, well, he sets the standard for like the next, what, thousand plus years. Um, even till today, right? I mean, the, the catechism, right, still holds that lying is um, wrong, right? Um, uh, I think there have been some maybe added things about perhaps uh, mental reservation um, that I think can be useful, right? Uh, uh, which are a bit um, nuanced or complicated, right? Because you have different types of mental reservation, for example. Uh, and then Aquinas hints at cases where there's things that look like lies that aren't lies mm -hmm. uh like speaking in a mystical sense which i don't think people can really do much these days um that's how he gets out of some of the biblical examples you have cases of um uh abraham and sarah right whether or not she was his sister mm -hmm. right uh so equivocation um you have cases of play acting Right. Also, where you're not really putting yourself behind what you're saying. Right. So it's not really an assertion. Um, so I think there's some added details, we might say, um, that people have thought about. And then also in terms of the definition, definition of a lie, whether intent to deceive is essential. Uh, Aquinas actually says no. Intent to deceive is not essential to the definition of a lie, mm. uh, which is very interesting because he doesn't really give examples here of there's cases where you could say a lie but with no intention to deceive but then if you look in the literature even outside of catholic circles there are some i think very compelling examples given where someone could tell a lie with no intention to deceive um so i think there's uh how do we say development in terms of maybe added detail that's been given here on this issue right um if you mean i don't know if um uh, the questioner was asking, could there be development in a way where we just say, well, these people are wrong? Um, mm -hmm. I don't think so, because, well, first off, I think they're actually right. Uh, uh, otherwise, I would have had to have changed my mind on this. But um, I don't always believe this, by the way. I, I think back when, as most people probably do when they're young kids, right, uh, thought lying was okay at certain points. And then, well... I think I heard about it by one of my professors in college who was against Santa Claus actually, mm -hmm. yeah. as a lie. And then I think I may have believed him for a while, but then forgot about it. And then I was reading Aquinas again was, oh, maybe I should think more about this and um, realized I think his views actually, or his view actually is just true. There's not really any good objections to it. So I don't think there can be a development in terms of like saying lying is sometimes okay. Because uh, I think it would yeah. just be mm -hmm. teaching something that's actually just false, mm -hmm. right, um, in that case. Um, in terms of the doctrinal issue, uh, that's more of a thing for the theologians. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the catechism, I think, currently does hold its always wrong, full stop, right? Um, the definition, um, there might be more room for debate, perhaps, on that. Um, question because it is a bit uh, complicated, but I will say the right to know definition was only in there like the blink of an eye in terms of the history. Mm -hmm. Right. S speaking of that, um, Father John actually asked this question. So I think um, there might be a nuance here in that maybe, I mean, we say the right to truth, right? But maybe we mean something more like you, you do, you deserve to know the truth, right? Um, mm -hmm. So he says here, the act of communication can possibly take into account the right to info the listener deserves or doesn't deserve. A Nazi demanding to know what's in my basement should be thrown off the trail. Mm -hmm. And then he even adds here, if I was a Nazi, the charitable thing to do to me is to lie. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, the Nazis should be thrown off the trail, if at all possible, by moral means, right? So maybe you could just run away from the house through the woods and have them chase you, right? Uh, maybe it's not the best in terms of strategy or tactics, right? That's definitely one possibility, though. Uh, my question, I suppose, is what's the di diff difference between the definition the questioner is proposing here and just the straight out right to know definition? It seems like whether they deserve to know the truth perhaps entails some sort of right to know the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, which gets back to, I mean, all sorts of the other objections. You walk into your doctor's office. Does anyone in the waiting room have any right to know or do they deserve to know your life story of um, funny or crazy things you did when you were 10 years old? Probably not, right? I don't think they really deserve to know any sort of the truth about um, things you did when you were 10 years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you hold the definition of a lie, that it's about whether they deserve to know the truth, right? Uh, that's only if they deserve to know the truth, right? Um, uh, and you don't say that it is a lie, then it, it seems like you telling them fanciful stories about your childhood when you were 10 years old um, really wouldn't be a lie when I think it really would be. It just seems counterintuitive, uh, I think, is, is the problem here, right? Uh, now, I know people can, of course, try to maybe add qualifiers as some people do right. try to do, but I just haven't seen any of these that really hold up at the end of the day. Um, Alan Binchlet seems to try to add all these qualifiers, but mm -hmm. then doesn't really even make it clear what exactly his definition is. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the problem, right? You can always kind of redefine your terms if you're wanting to um, accommodate them to maybe certain uh, conclusions. Whereas I think a better methodology is really to start with, apart from like the moral considerations, like what really is is a lie, right? Um, and I think in that case, we ultimately just have to kind of appeal to intuitions about the definitions, right? I don't think intuitions are always that good with moral questions, but apart from like moral questions about just maybe ontological questions, mm -hmm. questions about um, basic definitions of things, um, I think there is something to be said there. I mean, suppose that someone tries to kind of maybe have this presumption of dessert right on everyone and you need to have like these defeating conditions mm -hmm. where where you can then say okay this person doesn't deserve but the presumption is that people deserve i guess to not be lied to mm -hmm. um unless such and such condition are met yeah and then we have to see what the conditions are right yeah um to maybe know more about this definition but if you take that too strongly right that everyone deserves to know the truth. Well, staying silent, you're not telling them the truth. Equivocating, you're not telling them the truth, right? Uh, mm. So I mean that all these cases are actually wrong and you actually ought to go around telling everybody maybe everything that you believe or know. Mm. So it actually would be too demanding the opposite direction because you should be <laughs> continually speaking to everybody about, hey, guess what? Um, here's some uh, cool Euclid, Euclid uh, truths that I learned my math course or when I was reading Euclid. Um, so um, uh, yes, these are interesting uh, um, thought experiments though. Um, yeah, I just wanted to include, question. I just want to include Father John's like uh, statement there that he's not disputing what you're saying. He's just engaging in thought experiments. Oh, no, um, it's fine. I engage in all sorts of thought experiments about these, these questions because mm -hmm. um, uh, there's many people that have thought about the definition of a lie um, mm -hmm. for uh, that the literature and philosophy on the definition of a lie is uh, <clears throat> quite extensive uh, uh, mostly outside of the catholic world actually and they, they actually generally ignore the right to know definition it's more kind of in the catholic world it seems like people are worried about the right to know account um, but uh, yes, bring on the thought experiments. I'm, I'm all about thought experiments. Uh, they, they can be uh, useful, I think, at times. So um, Anaga here asked the question, can you cover Santa Claus under this? So I mean, maybe could you just bring up, you know, once and for all, should we be telling uh, our children or, you know, whomever about Santa Claus, that he exists and brings the presents? Uh, so... Uh... <laughs> I'm I'm all in favor of the the Colombian way, 
uh, in Colombia, they don't say the presents are from Santa Claus. Instead, they say the presents are from Jesus. Nice. Maybe okay. Jesus gives the presents. But I think there is, well, there's truth in that, right? All good things are from God. Jesus is God. Um, so all good things, including the presents, are from Jesus. Um, now, maybe um, there might be some misinterpretation. People might misunderstand what that means, right? Uh, maybe it would be right to then maybe explain the true meaning behind it. Um, but to say Santa Claus is real, um, no, I don't think this is a, a good idea. I think there's a cultural norms or practices in different countries, right, that perhaps we shouldn't get behind. I realize it's a bit unpopular view, but um, don't lie to your kids about Santa. Um, mm -hmm. There are other good things you can do around Christmas time. They're just as happy that uh, I think would be perhaps better than uh, the case of Santa Claus. Also, because, well, uh, if someone's lied to, right, about this issue, uh, then as a little kid, right, they find out, they might think later on, well, wait a second, my parents also told me God, right, exists. Mm -hmm. Why should mm -hmm. I also believe in God if I believe this on their authority, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it can also perhaps lead to cases of doubt where there should not be cases of doubt, right? Yeah. Um, now I get there's a lot of pageantry behind it and everything, but on the other hand, you can have a lot of that, I think, without um, needlessly telling that the little lie, right? Um, there's other countries where people are perfectly happy without Santa. Um, now, have Santa, okay, just don't uh, present it as if he's some sort of real figure, I think, at the North Pole. Um, mm. So there you have it. I bite the bullet on this one. Um, but uh, I think it's a good bullet to swallow, mm -hmm. right? It will pass too. Um, so Gavin here has the question, what is the, what's the easiest way to explain broad mental reservation versus narrow mental reservation, AKA lying? And where exactly is the line between them? Yeah. So this, I think is a genuinely complicated topic. So mental reservation, uh, generally speaking is where you're, you're saying something, but then you're mentally reserving in your mind, some sort of qualifier that'd be added to what you say. And uh, this might be perhaps reasonably inferred or maybe not. Um, so mental reservation is generally divided then into, you have two types. You have broad mental reservation and then um, strict or narrow mental reservation. Uh, broad mental reservations are where you're, you're saying something, but then the words that are mentally added, uh, you might say can be reasonably inferred by some sort of a prudent listener as to what might be added, right? Um, whereas strict or narrow ones, uh, a prudent person couldn't reasonably discern or infer what you're actually saying, right? Um, so um, I think people um, do this in certain cases um, a decent amount of the time, some of these mental reservations, right? Where maybe you're not as maybe exact or as precise in your speech as you should be, Right. Uh, but I think it's maybe mm, close enough that it's maybe it's uh, reasonably understood what you're trying to say. Uh, uh, the strict ones, um, I think they're, they're a, a problem. The narrow one uh, where you're, you're basically are lying. All right. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, according to this view, but I think this would be if someone wanted to defend lying, <laughs> not to give, my opponent's ammunition here, but uh, they should have just gone down the, the route to mental reservation, okay, instead of this right to know stuff, right? I think because I think mm -hmm. it would be much more defensible, also because there's a lot more literature, even in the Catholic world, on this. On the other hand, I suppose the strict mental reservation has already been condemned, um, so maybe they didn't want to go down this route. Mm -hmm. So one question that I also thought about was just, you know, kind of maybe going back to the same topic is, you know, suppose that, mm -hmm. you know, this is this is the solution that I personally developed. Um, mm -hmm. But now I'm going to develop a new one, because if anybody ever if I'm ever found in a comparable situation with, you know, people in my basement that I'm hiding. Right. Then I can't use this one anymore. So, you know, so be it. Yeah. I can, I'm pretty creative. Um, you know, so like, you know, the Nazi comes up to my door. And, you know, he asked me, are there Jews in your in your basement? And I just say, no, there are no Jewish rats in my house. Right. So mm -hmm. I say that 
not be- because the, the the thing that I'm calling Jewish rats, they just don't exist. There's no such thing that this kind of derogatory evil being that the Nazi perceives, right? And so if anybody right. who knew me heard that, they'd know, okay, yeah, he's he's yeah, he doesn't really believe that there are Jewish rats that exist anywhere. Whereas the Nazi, not wrote instead of ten synagogue, right? This doesn't happen, right? <laughs> right. You could, you could, sense. you could, you could do all kinds of things with, with that particular kind of answer, right? So I don't know. Do mm-hmm. you think that's a permissible way to respond? I think so, right? Because um, uh, they're going to interpret it in the derogatory sense, but you that's on them. Um, mean mm-hmm. it in the literal sense, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so yes, I, th- I think that is permissible in in, in that scenario. Right. And, you know, you use the example of, let's say that you have a hard time answering them and you're like, you're, you have a sore throat or something like that. Right. Even supposing that you don't actually have a sore throat. I mean, it is deceptive, but you wouldn't say it's lying if you kind of just like, you know, like something like that, like you kind of make it seem like you can't answer the question because you have this mm-hmm. debilitation that you don't actually have. Yeah. So I don't think all cases of deception are lies. OK. Mm-hmm. Um I think there's cases of deception that are actually morally okay. Uh, and I think a client is, is okay with cases of deception, right? That aren't lies, um, at least in some, some cases, maybe not uh, all the time. Uh, so you have cases where people misunderstand what God is saying, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, then I suppose you have the case that uh, looks like someone brought up a case of the angel in Tobit, uh, which I haven't actually, I don't have anyone that's, brought up that as a case of lying before, interestingly, um, or as a sort of objection, uh, be interesting to think about, right? Uh, so there's cases where people might be deceived, uh, but it's not really a lie. Uh, there might be cases where you can tell the truth, right? Where people are deceived or even in staying silent, right? Uh, but I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that per se. Uh, all right, here's another question from Gavin. He asks, do you know of any distinction between self-defense and lying in self-defense? The sentiment is that people think it's wild to think that you can kill someone, but can't lie to them. Uh, I mean, we might say there is some sort of sense in which you could have a subcategory, I suppose. There's different ways you can defend yourself or have self-defense, right? You mm-hmm. can do it by means of... Lethal means, non-lethal means, under non-lethal means, you could have sorts of um, violent instances of self-defense that don't take someone's life, and then maybe non-violent instances of self-defense. And then somewhere in the mix, you could have, I suppose, cases of where you lie in defense of yourself, right? Um, uh, The distinction alone, I don't think, is really going to get you any strong moral conclusion one way or another because well not all cases of self-defense of course are morally licit right so if you blow someone away with a shotgun uh, as a private individual right in defending yourself when maybe you could have just shot them in the legs right or somewhere else i think would be uh, morally illicit actually uh so um, we, we almost need to ask maybe the prior question, is lying ever morally okay, apart from that self-defense sort of a question, right? Now, I realize people try to draw some sort of analogy between the two, um, which I've written on this in my, my book. Um, so buy a copy if you haven't. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, there's an article uh, that I wrote. Um, I forgot the title. It's in the ACPQ again. Mm-hmm. Um, something about the analogy with, with, uh, violence. Um, oh, I, it's like, uh, the Aquinas held killing is sometimes listed. Why not lying? Uh, so I discuss why there's not really a strict analogy between these two views in there between killing really in the case of, uh, lying, right. Uh, cause you have cases of killing that can be accidental, right? I don't really think there's any case of lying that's actually accidental. Mm-hmm. If you accidentally blurt out something, uh, I don't think you really can be lying, right, in that case. Or say someone's like on a heavy dose of sleeping pills or some sort of medication, right? And they're just saying things but without any sort of act of the will there. 
uh, I don't think that's a case of lying because for you have to, for lying, you have, there actually has to be some built-in intention to the assertion. You actually have to be intending to say what you say, mm -hmm. right? Whereas killing, you can just mm. you accidentally trip and pull the trigger and kill someone. Um, that's quite a bit different, I think, right? I remember you said that Aquinas thought that um, you know, obviously you have to intend the assertion, but you don't have to intend deception. Is that is that correct on what Aquinas thought there? Yeah, so he, he just explicitly says intention to deceive is not essential to lying. Mm -hmm. Which means really you have you can have cases of lies where there is no intent to deceive, there's still lies. Mm -hmm. Which I think in terms of development, actually, this is a bit of a development on the issue because Augustine actually is undecided on this issue. Yeah. If you read Contra Mendacium or De Mendacio, right? Um, which is also interesting because when the catechism quotes its definition of lying, where is it, who does it reference or where is it getting this definition from? Augustine. And the actual passage in Augustine where it's quoting from Augustine actually is saying, well, this is basically a case of a definition of line that more or less holds good enough for most cases, but I'm not actually sure whether this actually universally holds. So I think the catechism is proposing that uh, they're in that context, right? Um, mm -hmm. Now Aquinas comes along and actually decides, no, you don't need intent to deceive essentially. So you have some development there, but once again, he doesn't say what these cases are. So we have to kind yeah, of right. figure out what they would be. And um, I think there are some, though, that you could um, mention that, uh, like, the, <clears throat> there's a case of a, a, a college dean that's mentioned in the literature. So these are people outside of uh, Catholic circles, actually, who, who mention, mention these cases of, of bald-faced lies. So say there's a student that's caught cheating on an exam. And everyone knows that he was cheating on the exam. You could even say there's video footage of the student cheating on the exam. The problem is the uh, penalty, we could say, uh, for the student, right, to fail the class is uh, when he's brought before the dean, is the student has to admit that he actually was cheating on the exam because the college dean really just cares about lawsuits against the university. And so he'll only penalize the student, get him expelled from the course or fail the course if the student actually admits he's cheating, right? So say the student even knows about this policy. So then the student decides, well, um, and when they ask him, did you cheat on the exam? He says, no, but everybody knows he's lying. The student knows he's lying. The dean knows he's lying. The professor knows he's lying. We could even say the professor and the dean even saw him cheating, right? Mm -hmm. um, but he's going to get out of, say, getting expelled or failing the class because of this strange policy that the, the dean has, right? We wouldn't say there's really, I think, an intention to deceive here in this case because you can't, strictly speaking, intend the impossible. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's impossible for them to be deceived because, well, they're just frankly not deceived. They, they can't be really in this case. Right. But we would still say he's lying. Mm -hmm. We'd say it's a bald faced lie, just bold. So I think something like this perhaps is what Aquinas had in mind. We can have a case where there's a lie, but there's no intention to deceive. Uh, yeah. Which he doesn't bring mm -hmm. up, but you have people today within the last, um, I don't know, maybe 50 years that bring up these cases, which I think actually just shows how brilliant really Aquinas was to think some of these things through. Uh, and maybe when he was writing, maybe didn't feel like he needed to give an example or who knows, maybe he writes a lot, you know? So sometimes mm -hmm. I know even, even in my writing, there's, there's things I write, but then maybe I don't always put in all the details behind my reasoning. So then people ask me what I was Meaning, I said, well, here's maybe more of what I was thinking. I didn't add all the details because I figured people would piece together some of the, um, the reasoning. Uh, maybe something like that was happening in Aquinas is my, my guess. Yeah, like, I mean, another example that I, that I just thought about would be something like a mobster, right? Who, like, 
-hmm. He's on video camera stealing, mm -hmm. let's say, you know, some jewelry from a shop. Mm -hmm. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows it's him. He knows it's him, right? Like, mm -hmm. and then at this point, he's given the chance to, let's say, you know, recant or, or you know, tell the truth, mm -hmm. right? And he just, no, I, I didn't mm -hmm. do it, right? Because mm -hmm. it's more like out of principle mm -hmm. or something out of like a sense of loyalty to the mob or something like that. He just continues to deny, even though yeah. he has really no possible way of intending to deceive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like it could be a similar similar case here, right? Mm -hmm. So Father John, again, uh, uh, has once again contributed. He says, what about a listener who will misunderstand the truth and walk away deceived, but, we're mo but will more readily understand the truth if a lie is told? For example, if a man answers no to the question from his jealous wife, did you dance with anyone at the wedding? The whole truth is that he danced with his mother. Um, just tell the truth. I mean, can't, can he tell the truth? But uh, presumably the scenario is set up where you have to tell the lie, right? Um, I mean, once again, in this case, uh, uh, you shouldn't tell the lie. I, maybe if you had a case of dementia I might maybe change the case of the scenario. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess I wonder first, why can't he just... Mm -hmm. Say tell yes the whole, and then qualify. Tell the whole it, truth, yeah. right? So, uh, if you can tell the whole truth to clear up a misunderstanding, I think you sh you should tell the whole truth to clear up the misunderstanding, right? Unless there's some sort of good reason why you shouldn't um, clear up the misunderstanding, right? Like in the right. case of the Nazi mm -hmm. at the door, right? In the rodents case, right? You don't mm -hmm. need to go and clear up the misunderstanding. You shouldn't actually if they <laughs> misunderstand you, right? But maybe the wedding scenario, you should go back and mm -hmm. be like, "This is actually what I meant." But what if, like, let's say just prudentially, right? Let's say, you know, your jealous wife, right? She says, mm -hmm. just say yes or no. <laughs> and she doesn't want to hear yes, but, or something like that, or anything like that. Or, you know, or, or honey, I dance with, no, no, no. She just wants yeah. yes or no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I realize if you're under pressure, you might just blurt something out, right? Um, so in that case, um, uh, I mean, Lies are always wrong, okay, and some lies are much worse than others, particularly if you're shortchanging somebody in money, right, or defrauding them, right? Um, if it's a smaller one, of course, well, it's not as bad as the other things. It's, you might say a small evil still shouldn't be done, um, but then you have cases of actions, human actions, where um, you might say maybe they're, they're less than human acts or less voluntary, right? Uh, so if the uh, maybe something like that could be occurring there because it, it happens just so quickly, right? You almost have like knee-jerk reactions sometimes, right? So sometimes in some situation, it just happens so quickly, you just say some yes or no answer, right? Something like that could possibly be going on there, right? On the other hand, if you actually are thinking about it, um, which hopefully you're able to do, you could say, let me explain. <laughs> mm -hmm. Might be just a better answer instead of saying yes or no. Um, on the other hand, maybe it might be feasible for you perhaps to say no because she's under she's interpreting yeah. the answer in a certain sense, right? Uh, so this is the problem with yes or no, right? In uh, in Ireland, actually, uh, traditionally there is no yes or no's. So if you notice some of the older Irish, if someone asks a question, right? Is the sky blue today? It is. It is not, right? They don't say yes or no. So yes is really just a sort of short word that we use, which actually really is a stand-in for actually a proposition to really repeat the affirmative of uh, say what we've heard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, what is the yes or the no in this case really? standing in for and it, perhaps there is some sense in which maybe the no is standing in for something right where uh, you'd be not denying um something truthfully right in the sense in which she's interpreting the question so jack here asks uh, an interesting question and i hope i'm understanding him properly but he says look truth demands in the first place that you acknowledge the real context of a situation in which the question I'm presuming the question here is like, you know, do you have Jews in your basement? It means nothing more than help me commit a, the, the murder. 
do you answer affirmatively? So the question is, do you have Jews in your basement? Right. And I guess what uh, Jack is implying here is like, well, even though that question, what that question really means in the context is help me commit a murder. Um, and obviously I you like, want to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, we might say it's implied, right, in mm -hmm. the context. I don't think that's really what the question really in itself means, though, right? Because uh, if that was the case, then there'd be no difference between saying, are there Jews in your basement and saying something like, help me commit the murder. But if you think about it, those are actually two different uh, um, sentences mm -hmm. in, in that case. Whereas if you had something like, help me commit the murder or you must help me commit the murder, those don't seem to be significantly different sorts of sentences in that case. Hmm. So I I think that it's just that you have things that are implied, yes, contextual, uh, which sometimes, yes, that context does have a role to play, but I don't think it really just fundamentally alters the meaning, at least that radically in that scenario that we have at hand. Um, otherwise, you could do the same thing with all sorts of other yeah. situations, right? Someone's in court and say, well, but look, the context. Uh, I don't think in terms of just the definition of a lie, regardless of the moral question, that's really a good route to go, right? Let me ask maybe one more question here from the chat, and I think we can wrap up. So um, I guess Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship, he proposed like two different, well, actually the, the same solution in two different ways to like how he would approach the Jew, the Nazis at mm -hmm. your door asking the question, do you have Jews in your basement? Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to read the story, but then get to the question or at least formulate a question from it, right? So he's talking about when he worked at a Catholic parish and one day this guy comes in asking if he could give him money and he says, no, he said, no. Um, and then the guy replied, but they don't give you the keys around here to money boxes. I think he's a custodian, I believe. Um, and th his answer was, do you think they would give the lowest guy on the totem pole access to money? <laughs> really, I did have access, but he didn't know from what I said. <laughs> and so it's kind of like a rhetorical question. Right. And then even like earlier with the with the Jew, with the Nazi and the Jew example, he said something like um, he would reply would I be so foolish or would anyone be so foolish as to harbor enemies of the state in their house? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that one? So in terms of, of questions, uh, questions don't really have any truth value. So for lying, you have to be making an assertion, but assertions are only putting yourself behind what are propositions or what some people might call statements. Right. Mm -hmm. So something like I am the lowest guy in the totem pole, that would be like a proposition or a statement. Right. Uh, or I'm holding a glass of water. Right. These are propositions which are different than questions. Uh, you also have um, re requests or commands. Right. Uh, which uh, are cases of sentences that don't have any truth value. So I think in order for their property really to be um, a lie, it actually has to be something with some sort of propositional content. So strictly speaking, questions um, are perhaps a good strategy in some mm -hmm. cases. I'm not sure I would condone that in the exact situation. I maybe have to uh, see more detail, but uh, it definitely seems feasible. Um, there might be one case maybe where you can have commands that are lies, but it seems like it's practically non-existent. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I think generally for the most part, you can't really have commands that are also lies or if you tell someone to jump, right? Um, I mean, why would you say this unless you wanted them to jump? Uh, but um, I, I think that's a reasonable, reasonable, response to the Nazi at the door scenario, for example, ask them questions, just mm -hmm. ask them questions. Be like a good cross-examination attorney Flip the or defense or attorney, the table, yeah. <laughs> ask everything in questions, the Nazis, mm -hmm. which in that case, they might get really angry with you. So I don't know how good of a strategy that would be, but I, I must say there are cases where things do work out for these, these people who do tell the truth. So you have, uh, in uh, the hiding place, right? Nolly um, tells the truth and they get discovered, 
right? But everyone ends up being saved. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also some case I actually know in real life where um, someone was going before some uh, mm -hmm. immigration officials, right? Uh, and wanted to lie, but then actually decided uh, not to. I actually, somehow one of my friends was nice enough to actually tell this person about some of my work that you should never lie, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and she actually told the truth thinking she would get deported. But then the government official said, we actually know your situation. It's a rough situation. And if you would have lied, we would have basically locked you up and we would have, we would have de deported you uh, basically, right? But because you told the truth, we're actually going to work with you with your situation here to keep you in the United States or at least help her out with her um, situation, right? Uh, so there are cases where telling the truth actually does work <clears throat> out for the better for the person. Not saying this happens in all cases, right? But um, um, it's not like you have a slam dunk for the other side, right? Because there's some difficult situations where people might end up losing their life or other significant goods. Yeah. And actually, you know what? Um, I thought I was going to just do uh, that, have that be the last one, but I, I think there's some others that I just want to hit really quick. Is that okay with you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So Gavin asked again, are you familiar with any literature talking about how double effect does not apply to lying? Um, Apart from my own work, not really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Apart, apart uh, I think from, actually, apart from this book, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I take that back. Actually, now that I remember, uh, I think Christopher Tolleson briefly treats it in his book uh, on um, what is it, uh, like Christian ethics of lying or something like that. Uh, I think he briefly treat, treats the topic, right? Uh, I think uh, the issue is in double effect, right? You need to be engaging in some action, right? Where you intend the good effect, but not the bad effect, right? So for example, um, you could have a, a case here of, um, mm, uh, I suppose like blowing up a bridge in a just war, right? You're intending to destroy the enemy incoming tanks. Um, maybe in this case, Russian tanks these days. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to Russia anytime soon. Uh, <clears throat> you intend to blow up the Russian tanks by detonating on the bridge, right? Because uh, there's a column of tanks that are going down, right? Well, at the same time, there happens to be uh, some innocent bystander on the bridge, right? Um, can you reasonably do this under double effect? I think so, right? Given that maybe this is the only time you can actually reasonably blow up the bridge, right? Uh, I don't think this really applies to the case of lying, right, uh, directly because, well, lying in itself, we have moral problems with, right? So it can't really just be sort of a side effect of your action because it has to be something that's under your intention, right? There's no such thing as an unintentional lie that's an unintentional side effect of something that you're doing, right? Uh, there might be cases maybe of where somebody else is telling a lie, that's a side effect of your action, but for you actually performing the action, you can't have uh, a case of a lie, right? Uh, so it'd be more analogous to a situation where um, you have to shoot some innocent person and then the, that will detonate some trigger for the bridge to explode, right? Um, it would be more analogous to a case of someone trying to tell a lie whether you have a good effect, saving of life, but then a bad effect of someone may be deceived. Uh, so I, I think it's very hard to draw uh, upon double effect here, really to try to justify mm -hmm. lying if that's what the question is asking. Yeah, and I think this will this will be the play. Uh, oh shoot, wait, I want to think about. Well, okay, so um, and I'm sure like somebody might be thinking mm -hmm. in the back of their mind too about a situation where, you know, you say like I'm not going to go to the party, mm -hmm. right? And then you go to the party. But that, that that wouldn't apply because you're not intending to actually assert a falsehood there. You at the time you thought you weren't going to go to the party. There's not like this retroactive thing where it's like, oh, now you lied at that circumstance, right? This yeah, is you, very... you can change you change your mind. I mean, this happens, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
I mean, it, it looks like in scripture, um, even there's cases maybe where Jesus even changed his mind, mm -hmm. right? How this works, ask the theologians, right? Um, but if you can grow in wisdom, well, then why can't he change his mind, so to speak, right? Um, maybe it's possible in some way or other. Uh, Aquinas does mention the case of promise keeping, actually. So lying is always wrong, but cases of breaking your promise actually aren't necessarily always wrong. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if due circumstances changed, right? So you promised you'd go to meet your friend in Paris, right? Then, lo and behold, COVID came, right? So you can't go. Are you breaking your promise? No, because this, the, you promised under sort of the circumstances, right? Where there wasn't going to be some sort of a pandemic, right? That prevents you from going, right? Right. Uh, Likewise, if you promise something that is just bad, that you shouldn't have promised, right, then you should actually break your promise, Aquinas says in that case. So mm -hmm. the cases of promise keeping aren't exactly parallel, really, with the cases of uh, lying, um, even though I think there is perhaps some some overlap. So you can, you can give a promise lyingly, right? That's certainly possible, right? But whether you keep it afterwards or not um, uh, isn't necessarily always mean that you told the lie or that you're lying okay this is the absolute last one i'm just going to bring up because i i just think it's really awesome a kind of nice way to close yeah. out the conversation but justin the catholic says how would you frame our lord's command to be wise as serpents within the context of operating in a hostile environment such as described in peter's first epistle i mean i just want to add here really quick that like all these solutions that we've come up with to like how not to lie but to possibly deceive you know mm -hmm. like I think this is kind of maybe what what's in mind here because I think we're pretty clever with these um, solutions. But I don't know. What do you think about that, John? Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, this is uh, this question that this uh, um, that, was it Justin the Catholic? Yeah, mm -hmm. is asking right shows yes we should by all means support equivocation, silence, um, some forms of mental reservation, and asking lots of questions of the Nazi at the door, right? Uh, so yes, be clever, right? Uh, but don't tell a lie, right? So at least there's, um, you'll have some integrity there for, for the situation, right? Um, uh, now, on the other hand, um, you shouldn't just equivocate all the time, right, either. Uh, but I think that's uh, um, something we could take from, from that passage that is being asked there, right? Uh, good question though. So. all right well john thank you for coming on to my show again um and if any of you are interested in kind of seeing the book length treatment of uh dr scalco's work he has this book uh disordered actions with was it editiones uh, scholastica did i yes, get that right yeah I think so. german yeah. publisher yeah um, so that way it's at least legal in one country <laughs> all right well thank you so much Thank you for having me. So um, talk to you later. Thank you.